the May 7, 2018 work session of the Williamsburg City Council will come to order. Mr. Trivet, would you call the roll, please? Here. 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 Items for City Council meeting of May 10, 2018. This first item on the agenda, Council preview. Mr. Collins, anything you'd like to share? Sure thing. Um, first, May is Bike Month, and so Council will be receiving a procl proclamation from Bike Walk Williamsburg that was written from by Bike Walk Williamsburg from the current capital to the colonial capital to celebrate May is Bike Month. Um, then there's two public hearings lined up. The first is a request for a special use permit to operate Magic Touch Auto detailing at 1455 and 1457 Richmond Road. The second is the real estate rate increase public hearing regarding the budget. The next item on the agenda is the budget adoption, leading off with an opportunity for Ordinance 1801 to repeal the FY 2018 tax increases for tourism, and then the consideration of the adoption of budget for fiscal year 2019 uh, that commences July 1st, 2018. The only two items in the reports, is one item under City Manager for a Williamsburg Redevelopment Housing Authority City update to the agreement for the Memorandum of Understanding. And under city attorney reports, the resolution to appoint the board of equalization members. Questions, Mr. Chairman? We're not we're not obligated to pass the budget in May. We can hold over to June. We have time to do that. Or pass the meeting. That's right. Statutory. Yes. Uh, this takes us to the public comment section of the meeting. If anybody would like to address council on any items that will be addressed in our Thursday meeting, please come forward. Seeing no one, we'll move on to background presentations and discussion. The first is the National Citizen Survey Overview. Mr. Pritchett. Today, I just wanted to go through a, a fairly quick presentation on the National Citizen Survey. As we are about to kick it off again, uh, and the final process that we go through for setting the GIA, the uh, survey is intended to assist with these seven parts. And these are parts taken from the National Research Center's website. There are a couple more that they have listed, but these are the ones that we use it for. So everything from evidence-based decision-making to innovation strategies, communications and engagement, but primarily for performance measurement and budget. I want to talk just a minute about the Williamsburg Way and how this all kind of relates together because I think this is part of the picture that often is missed and sometimes is forgotten. The dashboards are our first layer followed by the National Citizen Survey and then the goals, initiatives, and objectives, the budget, and then the core vision is in the center. All of that comes together to influence how we reach the vision that the council has adopted for the city. So the dashboards are the first step, and of course everybody here on the council knows the dashboards are better on the city's website, and they're intended to mark kind of those daily performance tasks of the departments toward the goals that are set at the beginning of the process. And those goals are often determined by the results of the National Citizen Survey. So all of this kind of interrelates. So next we have the National Citizen Survey, which determines where our community's residents feel, statistically speaking, that the city's operations and services are falling as we are benchmarked against other localities across the country. So the same tool is used, so that the, the sampling is the same, and the results can be compared easily. There's one question that is customizable. Uh, there's actually several opportunities for a customized question. The city of Williamsburg really only uses it for one, and we'll go over that in a minute. Then we have the um, biennial GIO process, and this is the, the point at which you strategically set the two years' goals um, in, in the biennium, and that is intended to be the targets that the city is supposed to strive for to complete during that two-year period. And of course, that hopefully is based on the National Citizen Survey results and how we performed in the dashboards up to that point. 
And then finally we have the budget. And the budget is where all of that becomes operationalized into how we reach the overall goal of the city, which is, of course, the vision. And that ultimately relates to the core service values the city provides. Are we able to say that the vision, the vision statement that has been crafted by the city council uh, is accurate and true based on the results of the National Citizen Survey and the services that we're actually providing on that So now that that perfunctory piece is done, the basic services of the National Citizen Survey is what we have used for quite some time. Um, the cost of that is $14,985. This year, they've increased the number of participants that actually were surveyed to 1,600. I think in the past, it's been 1,200 um, different households that received the survey. So the 1,600 participants will actually receive a mailed, several different mailed pieces of information about the survey. It actually started today, so people will likely start seeing this in their mailbox beginning next week, late this week. And the first piece is a postcard telling them they've been selected to provide the report in the survey. And then it will be followed up by a letter from the city manager. And then, of course, that's followed up by the actual survey itself. And so lots of opportunity to get those 1,600 folks to actually take part in the survey. Here's what the citizen survey actually looks like when you receive it. Uh, it's a series of questions. It's not incredibly long, um, but all of them are structured very similar to this. All of those questions are the same, of course, in the tool that's used nationwide. The only question that is different is this one, and it's unique to the city of Williamsburg, and it does relate to division. Now, I want to talk to you just briefly about how this question has changed in previous years. In previous years, this question has been a single answer question about whether or not you thought the city was meeting the vision in a couple of different areas. At the suggestion of the National Research Center that performs the citizen survey, we have split that out now to get a more accurate reading about how the citizens feel about each one of the topics that's covered in the district. Because obviously you might think that the city on the whole is operating well in, in full partnership with those groups, but when we split it out into who those groups are, you might have a different opinion. And so we'll get better, more detailed data this year than we have gotten in the past on the vision of the city. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. The 2018 timeline, here it is. And of course, the, the object here is to try and get this completed before we begin the GIO process. So if you have that data, as you can see there, we'll complete it early August and uh, be presenting to you before that. So we should have an ample time to influence your GIO process. As I said, we're a little ahead of schedule because postcards actually went out. So. This is the 2008 survey results, and the only reason I put this up here is because this will be the 10th year since our first enrollment in the citizen survey. Uh, that's not to say that Williamsburg hasn't been doing surveys of citizen opinions for some time. Even before 2008, there was a concerted effort to survey the citizens and determine how they thought we were doing, but it was more of an internal effort as opposed to this nationwide benchmarking study that you used. So it'll be interesting. I'm not going to go over these results with you today, but I think it will be interesting, I told Mr. Collins, to compare the 2008 results to what we get back this year, being that we've had 10 years now of surveying and hopefully working toward a vision. So it'll be kind of a good time to check in and see if we're really making the progress that we can yeah, that's any questions. Any questions? Thank you. No questions? Thank you. Uh, well, I do have one question. Uh, what is the percentage of people who actually fill out the survey and, and send it back in? In the past, it's generally been around 20%. 20%? You know, a little low, a little high. Is that in line with other cities, or is there any way to track that? I don't know that for certain. It's a little higher than the national average, and it is statistically significant. Thank you. And it is very helpful having the presentation where you laid it out. I think it's helpful for us and for anyone watching today, too. I, I, I feel like it's important to see how it's supposed to help. Mr. Tripp, can you remind us? Who is, I know we're not, you know, it's a random selection of folks. Where do those names and numbers and addresses come from? They come from the U.S. Post Office. Um, what happens is at the beginning of the timeline, the uh, National Research Center has been working with me and Ted, our, our GIS expert, on have the city's boundaries changed um, 
significantly so that there's other areas that need to be taken into consideration. We supply all of that data, and then from that, they conclude with the U.S. Postal Service the addresses that should receive the mail. So those dots actually represent the household that will receive the mail. And so if you get roughly 20% respondents, um, do we have the ability to know how many actually receive? Yes. Uh, the process includes the, the purpose of the postcards and the, the other mailings that are sent out before the actual survey is to give the Postal Service time to return the postcards to the city. We have to count of those and the addresses that were returned so that we can inform this National Research Center that those were returned. Um, so yes, we do know who actually received the survey um, and then the survey itself is determined. Who actually completes it is, is kept by the National Research Center. Would there be an effort to, let's say, of the 1,600, 300 come back with valid addresses or whatever it may be? Would we, is there an effort to find 300 others, or do we just? I don't think that there's an effort to find 300 others. I think they ask the city to try and correct the address if possible, um, and then they proceed from there. Thank you very much for your presentation, Drew. Um, I think this is a step towards establishing our next biannual uh, goals initiatives and outcomes process, and this is an important one. Uh, it's one of the first things we will read in a GIS packet, so it's a good thing, and uh, I just had one question to follow up with that, um, following uh, Mr. Paz's question. So in terms of the surveying, uh, do they also list the addresses, the CSU addresses for students on campus, because they get a mailbox um, with Sandra, or with some of the students that would be able to participate with this mainly come from off campus. If the addresses, if those addresses, and I don't know. It's like know, a P.O. box. Yes. So if those addresses are receiving mail from the U.S. Postal Service, uh -huh. then they have the opportunity to be included in the Gotcha. And then if the students weren't here, because this is happening during the summer, it would be simply be forwarded to whatever address is listed Whatever process they've identified as the Postal Service. So if the, if the student has, has informed the college or the, or the student has informed the U.S. Postal Service yeah. that they want their mail forwarded to a different address, then it would be forwarded. Absent that, I don't know. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. Um, looking at the unique question in the 14 cities vision statement, we've never asked the question this way before. Right. So we don't have anything to benchmark it against. That's correct. Um, if we, for whatever reason, with the next PIO conversation decide to change the mission statement, which could happen, because I think we've created this one with the PIO two years ago, then we don't really have anything to compare it to. So, so in the long term, I'm just curious of how that helps us understand if we're doing a better job. So my answer to that would be, and Mr. Collins might have a different one, and he and I discussed this, and we ultimately decided not to split it out, and then when I sent that information to the National Research Center, they responded without even knowing we had talked about it, and said, we really think you should split this question out to get yes. more meaningful results. And so in our discussion, what we decided was, if the, the original question was, how is the city doing meeting its vision? And it broke it out into the sections of the vision statement. Um, so Williamsburg will become an ever more safe, beautiful, livable city with historic and academic renown. That was the first one. And so the question below that would have been, strongly agree, somewhat agree, with that whole segment. And then the next one was, served by a city government, so he should be led, financially strong, always improving and innovating, was the next question. Same, same, three, same category, strongly agree, somewhat agree. And then the last piece was in full partnership with the people who live, work, and live here. So we were asking the same questions. We just weren't dividing it out by each piece. So the way that we've done it is so that people can tell us, do they think we're really working in full partnership with the people who work here? And then do you think that we're really working in full partnership with the people who visit here? And hopefully what that will tell us is, the areas more specifically of the vision that we need to focus on, as opposed to being so different. I don't need to go here to see what's exactly, but let's say this came back and it said the city is 
and I'm taking, when we say the people who live in the city, who work in the city, who visit the city, those are exclusive categories. So if you live and work in the city, you would, the primary category is live in the city. Yeah. And if you work in the city, it's people who don't live in the city. I'd say the results came down to, I don't think the city wants all the people who work in the city. But it's filled out by people who live in the city who don't fit into that. That's fair. So, um, I don't know, it just seems like an interesting way of looking at it. I just have to see what this is. Sure. Well, if, if the council feels like you'd, you'd better go back to the old way, the surveys have not been made. Oh, no, I'm just curious with the, with the, how it can be in some way. What, what is the end outcome we hope to be able to get from this when it comes to how we're going to address policy in order to achieve what the citizens are telling us in the survey? Because these are all very general topics. I don't see anything in this question that would help me understand when it comes to GIO time. What should we do if we get a low score in one or more of these categories? What do we do in our goals, initiatives, and outcome to help raise that response in the future? Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point. It, it's, that point is exactly why I brought this up with Mr. Collins, because I said, looking at another category, served by a city government cohesively low. If I were a citizen, I don't know what that means. As an employee, I'm not even sure that I know what it means. Does that mean that um, it, the council is cohesive? Does that mean that the management of the city is cohesive? I, I just, I think everybody's going to define that differently. Obviously, financially strong, I think there's, there's probably uniform definition for that. Um, it may be that this process tells us, as we perform the next survey, that we're going to change this question from being so specific to the vision to being more general as to the responses that we're asking, so that we can better define the topic. Not that we want to change the vision, but we may want to change the question to get to that. Last question. Um, if Ms. Ramsey owns a home for a residence, and Mr. Foster rents that residence, who gets the money? It's an excellent question. So the, the citizens are there actually just right as the meeting was starting sent me an email with FAQ for questions that citizens might ask and not one of them. And the answer is that in that situation, if the land is owned by someone that doesn't live in the city, they want the resident at that address to go so. And I would guess that my rental house occupied by tenants they would get the survey and it would just sit in their back for the next three weeks or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave that between you and your tenants. <laughs> I don't think like that many of them will take it out in the next day. But please. Um, is there a call? I think I've done this in the past. Uh, is there an a, a, a option for somebody to, to write in extra stuff or general thoughts or is it all a survey? Like this. Yes, it's all a survey just like this. There's no opportunity to comment. Doesn't mean that you can't send the city a comment to another I county. I, I realize that that would be challenging to you know, put into a survey and figure out what that means. I find that. I think the experience of people feel free to send a comment. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Next is the farmer's market update. Tracy Herner, market man. Welcome, Ms. Herner. Thank you, perhaps, perhaps our board member, Vicki, has got me to give us some assistance. That, that side trade lifts up if you want to put your stuff on there. On your side. side, your left side. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Farling and members of City Council. On, the, on behalf of the staff, board, vendors, volunteers, and customers of the Williamsburg Farmers Market, I wish to thank the City of Williamsburg for its support. The market began as an idea of two Williamsburg business owners, Tom Power and Tom Aston. They envisioned an open-air European-style market in Merchant Square, similar to those they'd visited in D.C. In early 2001, there were only around 1,800 markets in the country. 
collaboration between the City of Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, Merchant Square Association, the Williamsburg Land Conservancy, and William and Mary made the Williamsburg Farmers Market a possibility. Um, in 2001, consultants from DuPont Circle Farmers Market in DC came to meet with the steering committee. Um, and the first season began July the 6th, 2002, with 16 vendors. Um, that season was just 20 weeks long. Um, in 2005, the market became um, a not-for-profit 501c6. The mission of the market is to sustain, foster, and operate a weekly farmer's market in Merchant Square for growers and producers to sell fresh seasonal food and farm products direct to the consumers in the Williamsburg area. In order to um, obtain that mission, we do that through the following objectives. Um, the first being to provide healthy regionally produced food to all economic levels of the Williamsburg community. In 2013, the market began a token program as a way to accept SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Benefits. From the start, the market matched that benefit amount dollar for dollar, so however much was spent using SNAP benefits was doubled in order to increase um, affordability and access to that fresh local food. And this was really intended just to make it more affordable and equitable to all of the Williamsburg community. Currently, the SNAP matching does not have a limit. Thanks to funding from our community and the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Grant, the market was a sub-awardee of in 2015. Currently, for every dollar the market that customers spend in SNAP benefits, they are matched an additional dollar to use on fresh fruits and vegetables at the market. In addition to that, for every $10 that our customers spend in SNAP benefits, they're actually given another $5 to spend in anything that's SNAP accessible. And in case you don't know what that is, it's anything that you can eat at the market. So anything edible, just not flowers or soap or not sharpening. So it really leaves the majority of what we have at the market for purchase by those people. Um, we started our program the first year. I think we did a little over $1,000 in SNAP benefits. And the conclusion of last year, we were all the way up to nearly 8,500. So it's definitely a program that's growing. Um, the stats for 2017 aren't all in, um, but from, from what they're saying, the growth of SNAP benefits um, have decreased. But the use of SNAP benefits at farmers markets, especially in the state of Virginia, have increased, which is showing that the work that we're doing to make sure that fresh fruits and vegetables are more equitable, it's actually working. Um, the market also accepts credit cards and William & Mary Express making it easier for the customers in the market to support the vendors. This really helps to stimulate the regional farm economy and preserve the agricultural land. In order for our farmers to stay farming, they have to make a living, and selling direct to consumers is a great way to do that. In addition, the market accomplishes that objective by holding a vendor meeting annually. This is not something that most farmers markets actually do, but the Williamsburg Farmers Market has held vendor meetings at least for the fi last five years consistently. This past year, one of the things that we discussed was safety and security. Um, so we were actually very fortunate to have um, several members of our um, Williamsburg um, Police Fire Department Colonial Williamsburg come and speak to our vendors to ensure that we're all on the same page and working together to make the market a very safe place for the vendors and our customers. Um, the next objective is to sustain and enhance the historic role of the Williamsburg Town Center as a premier gathering place for markets, social, cultural, and entertainment events. Um, one of the ways that we did this, especially last year during our 15th anniversary, the market hosted three forums and a conversation with Jerome Grant. Um, we actually held those forums here in the Stryker Center, 
and the conversation with Jerome Grant happened at the library um, in 2000 and um, sorry 2012. We held our 10th anniversary. Um, we held a fresh film festival for the community at the Kimball. Um, weekly, the market also has live music, chef demonstrations, and most recently, the Power of Produce Club for our children. The market board is always looking for more ways to add more fun and educational things to the market season. The Pop Club is a children's program that began in Seattle. Um, the market added it to our lineup of programs in 2016 with a grant from the Williamsburg Health Foundation in partnership with SHIP, which is the Student Health Initiative Program, through the WJCC School. Um, and we also had intern help from the College of William and Mary. Over 200 children participated each season. And that's something we're looking to bring back this year as well. Um, in 2014, the market worked with the Farmers Market Coalition and the University of Wisconsin to create standardized data collection practices for markets nationwide. I'm happy to share some of that data with you. You can see um, we, are, we are actually quantifying the way that we're helping our vendors um, stay in production. Um, one of the data collection pieces that we collect is the acres of farmland in production, and it's definitely impressive at nearly 2,000 acres. The average distance food travels from the farm to the market is 34.5, which, again, it's pretty close for statewide. Um, and the market is actually part of the Virginia Farmers Market Association. So the next time we present to you, we should actually be able to compare this with markets in the state of Virginia. Currently, there are 247 markets give or take a couple because it's early in the season in the state of Virginia and nationwide there's over 8,000. You can see farmers markets have really grown uh, since our market started in 2002. And every week we have around 4,800 visitors come and visit the market. Um, we've tried as hard as we can to figure out the exact makeup of whether it's visitors to our community or locals or students. Um, and we haven't really figured out a great way to break that down, but we know the majority of our customers have visited the market more than one time, um, which makes us feel strongly that a lot of our, our um, Williamsburg area residents are coming and supporting the market. And one of the things that make our, makes our market so very special is the wide variety of produce and things that you can purchase at the market. And we had, um, I think we had 81 varieties of different produce um, last year. And, and that obviously is um, reliant on the vendors telling us exactly what they're bringing. I know this weekend, to my surprise, I found um, chive blossoms at the market, which wasn't on the list, but very interesting product that the, um, the vendors are coming up with. Um, so for 2018, one of the um, new things that's coming this year, um, in 2002, our market season was just 20 weeks long. In 2018, we will have the longest season so far with 44 weeks of farmer's market. Um, that is actually going to include two special markets. We will have a market again during an occasion for the Arts Weekend, which is the first Saturday in October. We will be located in parking lot P6 um, by Barrett Seafood. And then also on December the 1st, we will have our very first market corresponding with the Christmas Parade. Um, and that will also happen in that parking lot in P6. Um, the hours for that, we're actually accommodating the parade parents um, and hopefully some of the children as they are moving on to the parade lineup and will be open from 7 a.m. to noon. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions?
And I would just like to echo Scott's comments, Casey. Thank you very much. And having looked at the farmer's market back then, like before you started, I've really seen the evolution and all of the strides that you've made to make it bigger and better in a variety of ways. And I think one of the things you commented on is not knowing how many visitors and students, but there are definitely a number of visitors there. Uh, each day when I work, you know, they come to Virginia Beach or at the time shows. And when I travel, I go to farmer's markets. And we are steps above many of them in terms of the types of vendors that we have, the chef's tent, the entertainment, and also the special presentations that you arrange. Um, I really like the one recently on the weaving and uh, the lace makers, and it just exposes our visitors and locals to other things that make us unique and, and provide that extra benefit. So thank you for all, all that you've done and continue to do. I agree with everybody. It's, it is impressive. Uh, I don't often go to the farmer's market. I work on Saturdays, and, but I drive by on this uh, past weekend, and the weather was past. So it's good to see that, and, and obviously I think it's a testament to the variety of products and, and the companies that you have there doing different displays and keeping it fresh, uh, keeping it fresh uh, theme there. But, uh, so keep up the good work, and I'm um, excited to see 44 weeks, and I think the, you know, doing something there for the sake of Christmas, um, you know, tap into the, the folks that are waiting for the parade to learn and give them something that do is what they Thank you, Tracy, for coming in and for your presentation today. I mostly concur with my colleagues and just to add a little bit more uh, to what the vice mayor has said, I think uh, the farmer's market has really evolved to become a staple of uh, the city's downtown vibrancy and, and certainly inspiring in many ways as this city, this body, uh, is engaged with its own downtown vibrancy uh, project. Uh, Certainly, this is a testament to, to show that there are many different ways to add a lot more to the Colonial Williamsburg area and also to the city as well. And from a countdown standpoint, um, you know, it's been a wonderful way to draw students out of the college campus and into the farmers market and engage with our local residents. Um, also, I think what's remarkable, and this is my final point, but, uh, what's remarkable is the capacity to grow after all these years since 2002. Um, I had the pleasure of attending some of the lecture series that you guys have held here in the Striker Bay, and it's incredible to see the amount of participation and of interest uh, in the topic areas that you guys have had. So uh, it's be commended and well done. Thank you for being here today. Okay. Turner, uh, just a couple comments and then uh, one or two questions. How do you track the number of visitors who come to you? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so, so there's multiple ways, and um, I'm actually in disagreement with the National Farmers Market Coalition um, on tracking. They prefer to do a sample count four times a year, um, and uh, which would be similar to what we currently do. Um, currently, every week we count customers on the half hour. So at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30, I myself personally walk up and down Duke of Gloucester Street and count only grown-ups um, who appear to be walking into or are currently in the Merchant Square Market area. Um, the National Farmers Market Coalition suggests that we do it four times a year and we do a sample count at every entrance for 20 minutes. In Merchant Square, there are eight entrances. So what we have done to sort of meet in the middle um, is we have four times a year, we have volunteer groups come in and they stand at our eight entrances for all four hours and do a complete count so that we can figure out how close we are to the recommended method of counting. Um, and that's sort of how we're getting the numbers of over 4,000 visitors because we currently count on the half hour, but what we are not doing is the follow-up question to see how long our customers are staying there. So we don't have the correct number to multiply our count by, whether it be times six or times four or whatever, depending on how long they're staying at the market. So they were not counting in twice. Good luck with that. Thanks. Um, <laughs> what have you done previously to coordinate with the 
Um, so previously we have um, met with the police. No, I'm um, sorry. I, oh, I, I okay. should say, what, how has the farmer's market been organized on parade day? We have not had a market on that weekend, even though we've had many requests and people confused by the fact that now that our season has extended every week through December 22nd, we always then say, except for like, Grand Illumination Weekend. And this, this year we're very excited to say every week through December 22nd, including Grand Illumination Weekend. I just want to particularly applaud that effort because as much as I love the parade and think it's everything that's wonderful about living in small town America. In some ways it's a bit of a missed opportunity because we have so many people downtown and the parade ends and they're all kind of like, um, well, where do we go now? I guess we're back home. And so the idea that there's a place where people can go after the parade and spend their money and, 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 and still enjoy each other's company is terrific. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, two other things I really appreciate, appreciate about the farmer's market are the um, chef's tent and the entertainment is periodically available because it adds a different level of activity and ambulance so it rounds out the whole experience. I'd also like to touch on your point about credit card purchases. I think most people are aware, but just in case they aren't, not every vendor at the farmer's market accepts a credit card. Yeah. But if somebody comes downtown to the market with a credit card, they can go to the market booth and buy tokens that they can then use at any of the vendors in the market. Yep, that's exactly correct. We, um, they never expire. All of our vendors take them. So we always tell people that all of our vendors take cash, some of our vendors take credit cards, but they're all happy to take our tokens. Again, thank you for that. Last question is, I think the farmer's market is universally loved. The only negative comment I ever hear from anybody is they worry about the number of dogs that are brought into the farmer's market. And I know that's a touchy subject because clearly a lot of people love bringing their dog to the market. Is that something the market management thinks about, deals with? Yes, and the board of directors. In fact, um, on Wednesday at our regular board meeting, um, we will be reviewing signs that are going to be added to the market potentially that talk about best practices, like no retractable leashes. Um, don't allow your animal to eliminate in the market. Keep your animal out of the tent. Those best practices are now um, made available in signs all over the country, luckily. So we have some really great models for the board to choose from. But that's probably something new that will be showing up at the market very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you that interpreters are people, too. But um, <laughs> does anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this takes us to City Council Communications. Hi, Paul, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, uh, this past week, I attended the Virginia First City's uh, annual meeting with Marvin Collins. Mm -hmm. The majority of the day, uh, we adopted their budget, elected new state officers, but more importantly, we heard presentations on other localities and how they've engaged with affordable housing, um, whether it's uh, Built environment planning or, or some other aspect of it. And from what I could tell, Marvin Collins took some notes down and hopefully that could be uh, used somehow for our upcoming GIS uh, process. So, okay. Thank you for sitting there. Okay. Anybody have anything else? I have one item I'd like to mention. This isn't the traditional city council communication. But I think we've all probably received a handful or two handful of emails. Um, regarding the, the budget and, and people's hope that uh, council will not approve a budget with a real estate tax rate increase. And I can certainly appreciate why people feel that way. Nobody wants to pay any more than they have to for, for what they get. But it's not as simple as saying, yes, we're going to do an increase, or no, we're not going to do an increase. It's what are we not going to do if we don't have that increase. And the major contributor to why we, why there is a proposed increase, why there's an increase in the proposed budget is the uh, need for us to meet our contractually defined obligation to the school system based upon James City County's contribution in their budget. Come on. So 
we, we don't have a choice. We have to do that school funding, and that is further complicated this year because not only does the school have more needs for what they're currently doing, but they're opening an entirely new school. So we've got the infrastructure and personnel infrastructure that needs to be put in place, and, and that costs a lot of money. And so we need to do our part to fulfill that. We have um, a few new positions that are coming into the budget, and I'm perfectly prepared to take whatever disagreement, argument, fact, however you want to put it. We're adding public safety personnel to the city's um, complement of employees because we know we need to do as good a job as we possibly can on fire and EMS. And I will guarantee you that anybody who's had benefit of those services will totally agree with that. And I think the vast majority of people who haven't been there, so thankful that they haven't needed that, would agree with that too. With police, we look at the issue with the schools. We have a new school opening that's in the city. We have to have a school resource officer there. We've only done, or we previously had a, a part-time school resource officer at the one middle school. And in light of what's been going on, or what has occurred, I should say, nationally, to not do everything we can to provide the safest possible environment <coughs> would be irresponsible. So we're looking at uh, increasing the police force to meet those needs in the two schools, and I'm pretty confident that every parent of a child in, the, in those schools believes that that's what we, we should at least do that, if not more. We have a position that we've talked about by the Commissioner of the Revenue to be an audit position. We're also, pretty, I think, I don't mean to speak for anybody else, but just speak up if you disagree. Probably feel pretty confident that that position is going to more than pay for itself as time goes on. We've got another position that's an economic development um, specialist, and that's going to be funded out of whatever means we have of collecting the additional tourism revenue. So it won't be coming out of the regular uh, real estate tax increase or the regular city operating budget. So what do we have left? I guess we could stop, you know, we could, we could charge for trash collection, we could charge for recycling, and that, we could do other things. The only thing that's left is staff compensation. And there's a proposed 2% increase in the overall staff compensation in the upcoming budget, along with an additional $500 increase for anybody who makes under 50000 Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? So I think the, the decision that's left with this council is do we want to go ahead with those staff increases or is there something, some way we can do that? But even if we, if we don't do those staff increases, if, let's say we do 1% instead of 2%, that doesn't give us the leeway to not, that's not enough money to not do the 3% increase. A three cent increase. Three, three cent increase. Do you have any idea, Mr. Collins, roughly about what a one percent increase equates to? I don't need to put you on the spot. Approximately one hundred eighty-seven thousand. Is the one cent increase? A one cent. For the one percent increase to staff. I have to look it up. Um, the the one thing, though, I, I I might ask is to think about because last year we did the. Um, the compensation study, and we did a reevaluation of a number of positions, and that was a fairly significant investment in personnel. And, and when I raise these questions, I also want to say, absolutely, I'm not questioning the value of city staff. What I'm questioning is our responsibility to be good stewards of the monies that are entrusted to us by the residents of this community and how those are spent, and balancing that with the needs of retaining and motivating quality staff that does excellent work for the, for the residents of this community. The challenge with every time we do a percentage increase on employee compensation is that in each successive year, we're compounding the impact of that increase. So I just want to make sure that we're all comfortable with that 2% increase, or would we want to consider some combination of a 1% increase with a 1% bonus if we attain certain financial performance over the course of the year, um, or not do or not do the $500 for employees who make less than $50,000. I, I just think that um, we need to think about that. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot here, but I welcome any thoughts on that. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, I thought about this a little bit last uh, on the 
together. Um, very well stated, the need for uh, the additional spending. We have money there. What do we cut on the other side of that? We don't find revenue to pay for these things that I believe are needed, as you just said, could be cut. I don't think we can cut pay compensation because so much of what community feels is makes our community strong and vibrant is because we have a nice look for motivated and then does a good job and they perform their duties. And you start to eliminate compensation when morale goes down and, and then quality of life in the city starts to get um, so where do you start making those cuts and do that kind of flowers and intersections? That doesn't really materialize to a whole lot of money. So I think we're, we're at a point where you know, we have to grow revenue. Um, just like in our own households, expenses go up. We have to find ways to raise revenue. We do that through you know, the job that we do and we make enough money to support our needs. Um, but expenses go up. Insurance is, you know, we have a 9% increase in interest rate this year. So, I mean, we can't do anything about that. We have to meet that obligation. So, uh, now I support that aspect of city managers. I would be more proud of the lower the quality of the city. Numbers of what those increases mean. Good discussion on Thursday too. But uh, yeah. I've had the same similar reservations. Uh, the idea of justifying this effect to the public. Uh, so as you know, across the road ways, it's not merit based. It's like fair. It's merit based. Uh, well, that's that's preferable then for the board. Um, had we not just done its own class study, um, prove that it was a $600,000 on the line of the And one, again, that gets compounded every time we do it for some reason. So we essentially, in adopting the recommendation of the current class study, we corrected a long term problem. That in the of itself is a lot of serious ongoing. So, you know, if we're not raising, not giving staff a raise at all for something at less than two percent, doesn't mean it doesn't happen later. Just we probably have to catch them up at some point. Do it incrementally, or do it at times. Because we didn't do raises for so many years, it's going to be enough for it to happen. And then, you know, and as a result, we've had to do catch up with $600,000 in one year. So I think they, we know that compensation is going to have to go up. Um, and if, we, if, we, if we don't do it this year and we defer to next year, it's just going to be a bigger hit next year. And I think the you know, private market parallels this right now. The demand for people. And the employees has gone up. And the availability of employees has gone down. Yeah. So it makes it harder. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a necessary act to justify the interest, but it is something we have to discuss with the other. Because if it means a full cent. No, other than what you had said, it's ridiculous how it was that the public safety in the schools. Definitely, things that are important to particularly schools and education are uh, really important for residents of any school. And I don't want to contractually get something that you know to do. Yeah, and I generally do, and I think maybe we can approach on this subject a little bit more briefly on Thursday or in a future work session. But I think that some of the emails I was wondering this morning, if you want to clarify this, from what I can recall, they also mentioned about the, the 2.2 million. Should the legislation come into play, why can we just use that to offset it? Other than that, you know, sure. Well, I think that this whole situation illustrates is the importance of why we wanted to create a way to invest in tourism product and additional tourism marketing. Because the great tax rate, property tax rate, in the city of Williamsburg for a very, very long time has been subsidized 
by the performance of our tours in the county. And now we don't have as much of a gap between the revenues that were generated from tourism and what we're getting from other tax flow. So the subsidy is decreasing. So that's why we're faced with the, the possibility or potential of increasing the real tax rate. Our hope is that if we can invest in our strategy is if we can invest in tourism product in the city and we can find additional money from marketing this community in the entire jurisdiction, we're going to grow that tourism economy further in a way we haven't done in many years because it will be a fairly significant change from the way we've approached investments in tourism. And that will hopefully stem the need for future real property tax increases. I, I just think that's a point that uh, I don't want the community to lose sight of. So every, right now, Mr. Collins, correct me if I'm wrong, right now every dollar that we get, whether from whichever tax increase that we get, whether it's the, the what the city council has already passed or what um, we could potentially do in concert with our jurisdictions, the city intends to invest all of that money in tourism marketing and, or I should say, tourism product development and or tourism marketing. Is that correct? Correct. So, from Mr. Zhang's point, even though there's that other potential increase, that money can't offset the potential for raising the real property tax if we really want to make that progress in growing the tourism industry. Otherwise, we're just pushing and kicking the can down. And I think that that's part of what has gotten us into the situation we're in now is because in past years, the money that has been, revenues that's been generated from tourism, and tourism has gone into poor services, and so we've fallen so far behind, and this is an opportunity for us to uh, corral those funds and make a real impact, and that was the discussion that we had last summer as far as the reason for it, and I felt it was a necessity. If I may, it's, it's harder to get to than just looking in the budget because the new positions are not in, in different times. That needs to be calculated. So if I can get you that number, if I could provide a, a staff call um, for this discussion. Uh, the, the cost of living across the country and in Virginia has increased approximately 2% this year. This is not a significant increase for our employees. This just maintains their buying power for themselves and their families within our community. And the additional $500 for employees that make 50000 less are for employees that will be more adversely impacted by the health care premium than employees that make more than that. And so the, the logic of staff in recommending that is to maintain what we did for employees last the last couple of years with the company class so that they're not losing ground but maintaining the efforts of the council and making that policy decision. And that's, that's staff's recommendation, and that remains my recommendation, and that I will have to provide transfer and information I need in making your decision. That's Michelle. I have a question. Is there any vehicle or method by which in the budget, I mean, I don't, I'm not asking you to do the financial part, but the legal part. If council decided that rather than increase the pay of people who make less than $50,000 a year, we covered the additional 9% that people who make less than $50,000 a year, $50, a year are paying for their health insurance. So we're not actually increasing the salary. Sure. Um, there, there is an obligation that the city has under the federal law with respect to the affordability of insurance. And so with respect to that, you would need to do something if it crosses that threshold. I can also say that in, in calculating the percentage that the city pays to the health premium versus what the employee, employee pays is in, established by certain um, benefit levels uh, within the pool. So there, there's a certain percentage that we're, that we're required to pay, and this is setting it to that percentage. And that would create, if we had that level of inequity within our employees, that some are getting more advantageous premium than others, um, other than just what, what they make annually, um, which 
may not be, that needs to be taken into account as well. It, it creates a perpetual inequity in the, the formula rather than recognizing the impact in the code. Still in five weeks. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and <laughs> uh, it's, it's not fair to employees to have different levels of premium payment in the more than five weeks. So, uh, w but we're increasing the pay of employees whether or not the get taking cities health insurance. Right, this, that's. That wasn't based completely on premium, but impact within the economy, and that being one of the major factors. Okay, if you could give us uh, the number, or the other number would be helpful to, uh, I think we'd asked both before, what, how many city employees were there in somewhere around 2000, fiscal year 2009, I guess, or, uh, and how many there are? There are proposed to be in fiscal year 2019. Because over that decade, we know the city's grown, we know the needs of, of our community have grown. Um, I, th I think one of the concerns that, and, and rightfully so, that our constituents have is, is government growing out of proportion to the community and having a sense of where we were 10 years ago? I think we know, based on my recollection, Right up you know, during the recession, felt the squeeze and, and they uh, didn't feel some positions were really down in the 187 range. Um, but we thought the county board would have been like that. I think we're getting a little bit ahead of that. Well, then maybe you could pick, I mean, then to be, yeah, maybe to make it more um, equitable, pick something like FY 2007. Just if I can have a number of that, that time, the dispatchers, with your kind of cities, there, there may not be an apples to apples comparison with just the value. Could you put in last question? <laughs> yeah, we'll explain over the time period that you okay. I think something like that would be helpful. And, and also, uh, I guess you would include contract employees too, because they're not in you know, the employee sort of employee. Doing the work, even though they may not be getting the salary, they may not be getting the benefit. Is that another option? Well, we don't have that many contract employees. <laughs> well, anything else on that? Any other city council communication? Schedule meetings, Mr. Collins, anything you want to highlight? Not at this This brings us to open forum. Anybody who would like to address council on any matter? ask you to please come forward, offer your name, address, and if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less, we would appreciate it. Mr. Kirkman. Mayor, members of council, Ron Kirkman, 001A, Suite 2E, Lincoln, Virginia, on behalf of the Hotel Mental Associate. <coughs> I heard your comments about hoping that the tourism economy would help spur growth, tax growth in the city. I think we're going to need some help from the department. Uh, we just heard the tourism thing that we're seeing record numbers of tourists. And that's not the case. There has to be a change in that mentality that we're going to We need to improve. And I think that we Consider that this Thursday. Someone's got to make a couple of points. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Anybody else? With that, we'll close the open forum. Do we have anything for the closed session? That we do. We will be on the closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia. Purpose of discussing one personnel matter for subparagraph one concerning appointments of boards and commissions, and two legal matters for subparagraph eight for the purpose of consultation on specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel concerning one settlement negotiation, two conflict closures. Second. Can I just call the vote, please? Aye. 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 Aye.
Council will take a brief recess and reconvene in closed session.